Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. For those of you that are streaming, um, we're having some internet issues this morning, so if it drops out, we apologize. We're also recording the service, um, so if it gets to the point where it's unwatchable, um, we'll upload it later on um, with with a good version, so you'll be able to watch later. Again, we apologize for that. Our worship theme for today is Mercy for All. Um, In our lessons today, we're going to hear about things that sometimes seem almost contradictory. In our gospel especially, we're going to hear Jesus refer to a Gentile as a dog. And he's going to say, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. One One of the things that the people were trying to wrestle with at the time is who is the grace, who is the gospel for? And Jesus wants everybody to be assured the gospel is for you. It wasn't just for the Jews. It wasn't just for one people. God wants everybody to be saved. And he says this multiple times in scripture. Um, we're going to see why God sometimes talks in this, in this language. For our worship this morning, we're using morning praise. Everything is printed in here. If you want to use that, if you want to use your um, pew, your, your hymnals in the pew, that is just fine. Um, we'll begin by singing hymn 581. It's also the, the hymn printed right in the beginning of page 45, if you wish to use that. Please stand for our hymn. Open my lips, hasten to save me, O God. Praise be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us worship Him.
Please be seated. We turn to our scripture readings for today. Our first reading is from Joshua chapter 2. We begin reading this morning at verse 8. But before the men lay down, Rahab came up to them on the roof. She said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Because of you, terror has fallen upon us, and all the inhabitants of the land are melting in fear before you. Indeed, we have heard that the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea in front of you when you came out of Egypt, and we heard what you did to the two Amorite kings east of Jordan, to Sihon and to Og. We heard that you devoted them to destruction. We heard, and our hearts melted, and no one's courage could hold up anymore against you, because the Lord... Your God is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. So now please swear to me by the Lord that since I have shown kindness to you, you in turn will show kindness to my father's house. Give me a trustworthy sign that you will preserve the lives of my father and my mother and my brothers and sisters and everyone who belongs to them and that you will spare our lives. The men said to her, If you do not reveal what we are doing, our lives are pledged for your lives, even to the point of death. Then when the Lord gives us the land, we will show mercy and faithfulness to you. She let them down through the window with a rope since her house was built into the city wall and she was living inside the wall. She said to them, to the hill country, get moving so the pursuers pursuers do not catch up with you. Hide there for three days until the pursuers return, and then you can go on your way. The men said to her, when we come into the land, we will be free from this oath that you made us swear, unless you tie this bright red cord in the window through which you let us down, and you gather your father and your mother and your brothers and your father's entire household into your house. If any one of them goes outside the doors of your house, his blood will be on his own head, and we will be free from guilt. Anyone who is with you in the house, his blood will be on our heads if a hand is laid on him. You reveal what we are doing, we will be free from the oath that you made us swear. She said, it will be done just as you have said. Then she sent them out and they went away. She tied the bright red cord in the window. This is the word of our God. Our second lesson this morning is from Romans chapter 11. We read select verses. We begin reading verse 13. I am speaking to you, Gentiles. For as long as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I am going to speak highly of my ministry. Perhaps I may make my own people jealous and so save some of them. For if their rejection meant the reconciliation of the world, what does their acceptance mean other than the dead coming to life. In regard to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but in regard to election, they are especially dear for the sake of the patriarchs, because God's gracious gift and call are not regretted. For just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy due to their disobedience, so also now they have become disobedient so that by the mercy shown to you, they may be shown mercy too. For God imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. This is the word of our God. Our gospel this morning is from Matthew chapter 15. We begin reading at verse 21. Please stand for the reading of our gospel. Jesus left that place and withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. There a Canaanite woman from that territory came and kept crying out, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. A demon is severely tormenting my daughter. But he did not answer her a word. His disciples came and pleaded, send her away, because she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt in front of him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered her, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to their little dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, yet their little dogs also eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, your faith is great. 
It will be done for you just as you desire. And her daughter was healed at that very hour. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. We'll sing our hymn of the day this morning, hymn 413. Dear friends in Christ, next Sunday, next weekend, is Labor Day weekend. And it traditionally marks the end to the summer, the unofficial end to summer, and the beginning of the new school year, right? A lot of churches follow the routine of resuming Sunday school, um, resuming Sunday school next week, and a lot of the activities that get put on hold during the summer. This year is probably going to be a little bit different. But usually the loose summer schedule becomes more ordered, right? In a normal year, we start doing things again. Why? Why do we do these things? Why do we come to church? Is it it just a force of habit? A routine that we learn when we were young and now we continue when when we grow older? Are we motivated by guilt or a feeling? that we're expected to, or maybe even a feeling of pride that I I go to church. Does it matter if we don't come? Does God take attendance? 
In one of our hymns, we have that answer. The line goes, no question will be asked us how often we have come, although we oft have wandered, it is our Father's home. There's a lot of reasons why people come to church, some of them not good, some of them good. This morning, we meet a woman in our gospel who gave her reason for why anybody would want to come to church. She came to see Jesus, and it's also why I come to church. A couple reasons is one of them is because I need mercy. As we look at this woman in our gospel this morning from Matthew, we see a woman who lived far away from the worship life of the Jews. Not just geographically, but she was a non-Jew. She was a Gentile. But she had heard about Jesus. Obviously, news of his miracles, news of his teaching, had spread like wildfire, even into this Gentile territory in the, in the north. And people, people were flocking to him because they had heard that he could heal them. This woman desperately needs his help, and she isn't embarrassed, she isn't ashamed to admit that she needs his help. But she isn't just looking for a miracle. She's looking for mercy. She's looking for God's compassion. To hear that he loves her, that he accepts her, to hear that he cares for her, and that his heart is open to her cries for help, even, even her a, non, a non-Jew. She comes to Jesus Strikingly, even when some of his own people refused to come to him. And she uses the term, she called, she, she called Jesus Lord Son of David. And this wasn't just an acknowledgement of his lineage as a Jew. This was a name that was actually a confession, a statement of belief from her, that he was the fulfillment of Scripture. He was the true, the promised Messiah. This, this term, Lord Son of David, She lived in a godless, a pagan culture, and she had received only tiny morsels of God's word. But we see by her using this term for Jesus, that's all that the Holy Spirit needed to give her faith in Jesus as her Savior. A truth that his, again, his own chosen, well-fed disciples, they were still wrestling to understand this. One of the hardest things for anybody to do is to admit a problem. Just think about your own life. When you're accused of doing something wrong, what is the first reaction? I think most of us would agree that as soon as somebody says, I've done something wrong, the first thoughts we have are, no, I didn't, or or arguments against what I'm being accused of, excuses for what I'm being accused of, all the things that God's Ten Commandments, his law, shut down pretty cold, right? This woman, you could see she was at the end of herself. She made the difficult, the very good confession, I have a problem. I come to church too because I need mercy. Walking through the door of this building for worship is admitting that I am helpless. I am a sinner who desperately needs God's help. I need a miracle too. Not a miracle like having a a child healed, but I need the miracle of God's forgiveness. I come because... I need to hear God tell me that he loves me in spite of who I am, in spite of what I've done, that he cares about me, that he won't allow life to overwhelm me, and that he is the only one that can help me. That's why I come to church, and I also come because I'm welcome. Now, this isn't our first impression with this meeting with this, this outsider, with this Canaanite woman. In fact, at first read, it seems like Jesus kind of ignores her. When his disciples urged him to make her go away because she was drawing attention and and embarrassing them, Jesus' response was, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The Bible tells us salvation is from the Jews. They are first in line to receive it. But then notice here, Jesus never shoos her away. He says things like, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel, but he never tells her to go away. He lets her continue to ask, to plead for mercy. He lets her ask, seek, and knock, expecting an answer, just like he told his disciples to do. At first, she calls out from behind the group, but then she comes and right up to him, throws herself at his feet and pounds on the door of his heart, crying, Lord, help me. And Jesus let her keep on praying, again, without chewing her away. She was welcomed everything he had. God's grace, we know, is is boundless. There is enough for everybody, even for this outsider. 
I come to worship because just like that woman was allowed to come up to Jesus, I can. I come because Jesus welcomes me. I'm an outsider too, a Gentile. None of, very few of us. I know I certainly can't trace my lineage back to the Jewish nation. But Jesus is the only Savior who God promised and sent into the world. If I don't receive his salvation, I would be lost forever in hell. There is no other option. Acts 4.12 says, There is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Only Jesus has those words of eternal life. Only Jesus has the ability to give eternal life. And friends, he doesn't shun us. He doesn't shoo us away either. And he does the opposite. He invites us to come to him. Not on, on my terms. The terms that would, that would screw up this relationship with God. Not as I want him to be, as my sinful heart would screw up as well, but as he is. The savior of sinners revealed in the Bible. He invites me to fall at his, she- at his feet and ask and seek and knock like every other believer and he wants me to expect an answer. I am here because I can be here by God's grace. Jesus welcomes me. That's why I come. And I also come because I'm accepted. And again, that isn't the way it sounds at first with this woman, right? Jesus replied, it's not right to take the children bread and toss it to their dogs. The Jews often referred to non-Jews as dogs, mangy, filthy mutts that live in the street. They eat the roadkill. There's two words, though. The words that the Jews used for dogs denotes that kind of dog. But the word Jesus used for dogs is more like a pet name. It's, it's a family pet, a little, a little puppy. Right? His point is the food on the table is for the family. The pets have their own food. But when the, pet, the family gathers to eat at the table, especially if there's kids involved, those pets are sitting right there at the bottom of that chair waiting for those scraps of food to fall to the floor. And this is what the woman says, right? Yes, Lord, she said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. In other words, you can surely spare a morsel for me without depriving anybody else. And this is a truth. With simple God-given faith, she presses him for his blessings because she knows that he really does want to share them with her. Because he really does want to share. But God doesn't have any family pets, does he? He has only children. So Jesus pulls out a chair for her to sit at the table as one of the family. And he does that for us too. No matter who I am, where I come from, where I've been, what I've done. Jesus accepts me as one of the family because he made that happen. He forgives my sins. He washes me clean with his blood. He dresses me up like the rest of the family in his robe of righteousness. It's an honor that none of us will ever, ever deserve. Catching only a few blessings from him would be enough, but Jesus doesn't just toss me a few scraps now and then. He pulls out all the stops. He pulls out a chair. He has me sit at the table where the main courses are served. When I come to church, I'm coming home to dinner to be fed with his word. He, I come and he dresses me. He cleans me. He gives me his forgiveness. He accepts me as his own dear child. I also come to church because my children need Jesus. No matter how young, how old they are. There isn't a parent who doesn't, uh, who doesn't love each of their children so much that they'd gladly take their place in suffering. But the sad truth is we can't. So we do everything in our power to give them what they need, right? The only thing this woman wanted... The reason she came to Jesus was for relief for her suffering child. And she wouldn't let Jesus go without getting it. And God doesn't tell us any more about her life. We know she went home to a healed, healthy daughter. But God doesn't tell us what else happened. But we can probably use our imaginations a little bit to know what happened in the days and weeks and months after this. Right? What would you do in that situation? Would you go home with your healed daughter and never speak a word to her about the one who had healed her? That wouldn't make sense, right? You'd want your little girl to know the one who loved her so much, who cared about her, who mercifully healed her. Would you want your son to know Jesus as his Savior too? Would you continue to talk about Jesus in your home? And the obvious answer is yes. More than anything else in life, no matter how young or how old they are, our children need Jesus. And we can't take their place. We can't live their life for them. But we can love them. 
We can share Jesus with them. We can pray for them. We can do whatever it takes to give them this news about Jesus. We make sure they learn about the one who loved them so much that he came to earth to live and to die, to pay for their sins. We drop whatever we're doing to go to Jesus and pray for them. We plead for their spiritual needs. We fall on our knees in gratitude for churches that teach his word, that welcomes children, that accepts them with open arms. We, we fall down on our knees in thanks for, for parents who carry out their duty to teach their children about Jesus in their daily lives. We help out with that in any way we can. We come to church. We bring our children to church. We pray for them. We share Jesus with them because they need them too. We also come because we receive God's blessing. Th that woman didn't go home empty-handed. Her faith was not disappointed. Right? Jesus said, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now, there are some passages in God's Word that especially catch our attention, make us sit up to take notice. And this is one of them. There are only two instances in the Bible when Jesus talks about great faith. And it's striking that they're never for any of his disciples. They're not even ever for any of the Jews. His two times when he talks about great faith is this woman here and also the, the Roman centurion. Jesus was overcome with joy because the Holy Spirit was working in her heart, had given her this faith that was this strong. It was just a preview. This woman coming to faith was just a preview of what would happen when his disciples would later take that gospel message out into the world, baptizing and teaching them to obey everything he taught. When Jesus calls this woman's faith great, he's showing us that his greatest concern in our life isn't that we're happy, isn't that we have the things that we need for this life. His greatest concern, friends, is our faith. He wants our faith to be great. He wants our faith in him to be strong, to be unmoving. He wants us to trust in him completely, to take him at his word. Even when the, the, what our eyes see deceive us, he still wants us to trust in his word. He wants us to depend completely on his mercy, to know that we, sinners, we are welcome to it, and to rejoice that he through Jesus has accepted us. We want, he wants us to trust that he always blesses us in the way that's best for us, even when it doesn't look that way. And he wants us to care about one another's faith as well. The, the attendance list that we, that we keep, we use for our service, isn't just an attendance record, but it's a tool to help us care about each other's faith. faith. If, if somebody misses a few weeks, we want you to know that we miss you. Even more, we don't want you to miss out on the blessings we receive only through God's word and sacrament. These, these blessings that we see given to this woman, but that we receive also, this is the reason why we come to church. Not out of guilt, not out of obligation, not to save face, not to look like a good person, not to show off. Not to put in my time with God or to have some kind of religious experience. I don't come to hear about me, about how good I am. I come to hear about how much I need Jesus, to hear about Jesus, to hear about the Savior who loves me. I come to sit at this table with my family, with the grace that God has given. This is the reason that we come to church. Amen. Now please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding, let it guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the Te Deum. We praise you, O God.
In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we remember Kathy, the daughter of Evelyn Kalsik. She was diagnosed with cancer recently. She's undergoing treatment, so we'll pray for, for the success of the, the um, means employed by the doctor. Compassionate Father, in your mercy you transform even sickness and disease into a blessing. With this confidence, we commit all who are sick or suffering to your tender care. We pray especially for Kathy. Provide healing and relief according to your infinite wisdom and boundless mercy. Grant patient endurance if her suffering must linger. Help her find true spiritual strength through Jesus and his cross during this time of physical weakness. By the work of the Holy Spirit, teach her to trust in your forgiveness, your grace, and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, Lord of the nations, look in mercy on our nation as we struggle with discord and civil unrest. Frustrate the plans of those who would stir up violence and strife, and bless the efforts of all who promote harmony and peace. Give to all our leaders and all in authority a special measure of wisdom and patience as they carry out their tasks, and grant that justice may prevail throughout our land. Help us as Christian citizens to reflect your love in all we do. Most of all, let the preaching of your gospel, which alone can bring true peace to human hearts, let it be heard throughout our land. Hear us for the sake of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, our Savior. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift of grace that we come into your presence and offer true and faithful service. Grant that our worship on earth may always be pleasing to you, and in the life to come, give us the fulfillment of what you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Let us praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please be seated. We'll close with our final hymn.
Good morning. Couple things. First of all, to those of you that are streaming, if you're still with us, um, the internet did drop. So if you're watching now, we will um, upload the full service here pretty soon. Um, we had some problems with routers. Aaron got them reset. So everything's working fine now. Um, but your stream probably cut out. The whole service, again, the whole service will be up here pretty soon. Um, the other thing, so we did a, a, a mask-required service last night, Saturday night at 7 o'clock. We ended up with 14 people here, which is great. Um, we're going to continue to do that. Um, if anybody wants to go to that, that's just fine. Um, masks will be required for that, so keep that in mind. Um, the question that I have for you and I want you to think about and, and let one of your church representatives know is, um, with two services, we're not, we haven't done this um, at least since I've been here, to have two regular services. Um, for the Lord's Supper, what I'd like to do um, is, is, weather permitting, the third Sunday of this, of this next month, so third Sunday of September, which would make it right around the 20th, I'd like to do one more outdoor service with communion so that the whole church can come to the Lord's table together. Um, think about it. Let your, let your uh, elders know. Let the, the leaders in the church know so we can talk about it and figure out if that is something um, that we do want to do, um, if that's something that you really, really, really hate the idea of doing another outside service, we could talk about it. Um, but I do want you to think about that and, and let us know. Um, other than that, I think we're good. Lord's blessings on your week.